very excited to um, uh, be moderating this panel today with some great minds uh, who've worked on following closely in the last year or two. Um, in this panel, um, we uh, are going to be a little bit uh, theoretical in trying to address questions of um, censorship and surveillance in particular. Um, and um, on panel with me today, we have uh, on my left, Colin um, Agar, and uh, he's the Bartlett Fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. Um, his uh, research bridges uh, the history of telecommunications and contemporary mobile phone <laughs> usage um, and seeks to understand the anticipated, the unanticipated consequences of network development. I'm going to ask him about that. Um, and then um, on his left, there is, we have um, Pranesh Prakash, who is the policy director at the Center for Internet and Society in uh, Bangalore, India. Um, he, his work today focuses on integrating and engaging with policymakers on areas of copyright reform, openness, freedom of expression, privacy, and internet governance. And finally, on my right, I have Stephanie Felsberger, and she is um, an Access to Knowledge for Development Center researcher, and um, we've been working together on theorizing surveillance um, a lot recently. And uh, if you've been on our blog, you should read um, the latest uh, blog on Francier's notion of progress. Um, it's one of my favorite blog posts so far on the blog. Um, I'm going to, um, again, um, this is going to be uh, around the conversation uh, amongst us here on the panel, and I'd like to uh, quickly move into uh, the floor to engage with us. But I'm going to um, start maybe with asking Pranesh um, to uh, uh, engage uh, with the audience on uh, an issue that he talked to us about a lot, which is the issue of invisible censorship. Um, and you know the different ways in which um, censorship occurs without us even realizing it does. And you have been talking about how this is the bigger danger. Because it's one thing to be conscious that you're being censored, but it's a completely other thing to not know um, what is being taken away what, from the narrative. So maybe you can spend some time talking about that. <laughs> summarize uh, the issue. Uh, and I'll go a little deeper into how this issue arises. So the internet is essentially a large, well, in the previous discussion we were talking about how it's a network of the sphere. And, and I'm here to convince you that, in fact, it's largely a private sphere uh, in which the public has limited rights. And, and that's how it emerges as a quasi-public, private sphere. <clears throat> so um, the, the special rapporteur, the former UN special rapporteur of freedom of movement and expression, in fact, Peru, uh, has uh, you know had been comparing the internet uh, to what he called uh, La Plaza Pública, the, the public square. Uh, he's got small man, and he compares the public square. But well, really, the internet is more like uh, a contract, like a public sphere where you, know, you have certain guaranteed rights, but more like a shopping mall where you have some limited rights, perhaps, but it's not uh, it's not something guaranteed by the constitution, uh, not something that that you can you know, go to the University Declaration of Human Rights and claim because you're not making that claim against the state. You're trying to make that claim against a private party. And that's the most important thing to realize, that the internet cannot but be private. That is, you can't have a purely public internet. Um, even if you say, I want to separate out from, for, like I want to run my own web server, I don't want to depend on Google's blogspot or Facebook, etc. Well, I can do that. I can run my own web server, I can even run my own social network connect to other people, they can tell me what I have to say. But that traffic has to necessarily go through my ISPs, uh, it has to necessarily go through their ISPs. Okay, say, now I want to say I don't want to depend on this one ISP, I want to run my own ISP, I run a you know, private telecommunications company, except it still has to go through multiple you know, servers and 
multiple ISPs on its route to reaching them. So there is no way possible that a network of networks, uh, the way we have right now, can effectively uh, at all become separated out from the corporations that run these networks. That run the, the connections between these networks that run the nodes in these networks. So it is essentially uh, private companies that are that are running the internet, and we have some amount of leeway uh, uh, in terms of traveling over it. Now, what consequences does that have? Importantly, uh, the kinds of rights that we expect to see from states that we and and this expectation can vary, right? Uh, it can be a theoretical expectation that these kinds of rights that we have theoretically, that we theoretically expect from states, uh, don't exist anymore because uh, a right is, is more or less non-existent unless you have someone who's delivering on that right, unless there is someone with a duty uh, that correlates with that right. Now, uh, those of you who've been paying attention to uh, the work at the United Nations, uh, around business and human rights, would realize that uh, that uh, John Ruggie has come out with a framework uh, for how businesses, uh, while they may not have a duty to protect human rights, still have a duty to respect human rights. Well, that's that's great. Things we have some duty, perhaps, but how do we enforce that duty? And the reality is, we can't. So we, so from this kind of theoretical construction, uh, let's look to the issue of censorship more, more specifically. How much do I have time? Okay. Um, in India, uh, in 2012, there was this draft uh, put out, uh, which were draft regulations made by the government under intermediary liability, under which essentially this notice and takedown kind of system. But interestingly, this notice and takedown system, as opposed to the existing law in which you could enforce a notice and takedown system, uh, but you have to be paid to the government. Under what the government then brought out in 2012, you had to no longer be paid to the government. The government wasn't going to take part in any of these proceedings at all. Uh, you have to directly complain to the intermediary. And the intermediary, by force of law, if they didn't want to lose their protection uh, from liability for third party action, meaning if they didn't want to be liable for whatever you wrote on their platforms, they ought to take it down. Now, this creates a perverse incentive for intermediaries, and intermediaries is a very large term, right? It covers you know, everything from from your your web host, your DNS, you know, the, the company that provides you a domain name to you if you're running a blog and you're posting uh, comments on that blog saying you could be an intermediary. So all intermediaries were treated alive and uh, all intermediaries have to were, were provided a very strong incentive to remove content on complaints because there was nothing, no negative consequence associated with removing the content. But if you didn't remove the content, then you could possibly have negative consequences. So they didn't care. So and we actually did the text. We sent fake takedown requests, uh, takedown requests that did not comply with the law in some in different ways each time we, we made slight variations. Okay, we made ridiculous requests. Uh, we for instance, asked um, for an ad for baby diapers uh, to be removed because we claim they cause baby rashes and those were harmful to minors. I think they're just one of the categories for the law. And so we, we made all kinds of ridiculous requests and we found that in six times out of seven, the content that we had requested to be removed was in fact removed. <coughs> But the fact that we need to run this experiment, this uh, policy sting operation to be made, just goes to show that there was no other way of actually studying this. 
there was no way that we could use methods that we had able to use, such as filing rights and information requests and finding out how many times, like, you know, how many times the government has blocked the website, uh, etc. How many requests the government has blocked for blocking the website? Etc. You couldn't ask those kinds of questions because now nobody knew. And so, right now, if you ask me, how many times has this law been used to take down content? I don't know. The government does not know. No single party knows. Different private corporations perhaps know how many times they have removed content, but they don't publish that information. Even companies like Google and Facebook, which nowadays publish transparency reports, don't publish requests that they, uh, information about requests that they get from private parties, with in some exceptional cases about, uh, about copyright, some companies uh, to publish other. Otherwise, they don't publish this kind of information. And this essentially means, and, and uh, you can see this happening not just in countries where, like India, where we have this law, until we have um, partially read down by the recent Supreme Court judgment happening, but in South Africa as well, we have a very similar law. So not just in these kinds of countries, sorry, countries where these kinds of laws exist, but even without the existence of these laws, what we find is just through terms of service, right? Uh, by complaining about terms of service, you can get onto the road. And, uh, and what we have missing there are the kinds of procedures we expect from you know, an adjudicatory body, such as a court, which actually looks into the content and says, you know, gives a fair hearing to the other side based on you know, some uh, history, some precedents, and uh, decides one way or the other. You have a right to appeal. These kinds of procedures which we have worked out over many centuries in, in, in many cases are completely absent. Uh, and more than the absence, uh, the fact is it all that there is no there is no right to demand this either because it's not a state. So that becomes important. Now I do have a partial solution. Uh, which I can come to later, but I feel I've been speaking for, for a long while, so I'll speak about the solution. Okay, great, because uh, in the next round of questions, we would like also to hear what are modes of resistance um, to what you just essentially described as a natural flaw in the network, that it is um, naturally a privatized um, um, space, and it's interesting to interrogate the extent to which uh, rights-based approach, policy work, um, is a function of um, side resistance. But let me uh, move to Steph and also continue a bit on this um, theoretical thread. Um, we've been doing a lot of readings about the phenomenon and um, critiques of the theory that um, there is a hierarchical mode of power in the way uh, we're being censored. Um, and you know, some of the um, evolutions of the theory is that it's not necessarily someone from above that is uh, censoring or uh, looking over us. There is actually a more horizontal mode of, um, of, of, of censorship. So, um, so in other words, surveillance takes place in more casual, um, everyday ways um, than the formalistic practice of power. So. Uh, maybe uh, you can tell us a little, bit, a little bit more about these thoughts and particularly in context of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so um, what we found out when we started reading about the theory about surveillance was that there's basically two concepts that are being used. And one of them is the panopticon by Foucault that Nina already mentioned, and the other one is George Orwell, which is interesting because it's only a novel, it's not even a theoretical framework. And um, yeah, when it comes to Foucault, his, in his panoptica he describes this, it's based on a, on a, group, a blueprint for a prison that was written in the 18th century where there's one central, like one central watcher that watches over all the other inmates and um, the inmates aren't really aware that they can't see the watcher but they, they're under the impression that they're constantly watched, they're isolated and the aim of this uh, setup is to change their change their mindset and like, make sure that they comply with all the rules in the, uh, in the prison. And then this, this framework isn't the best way to describe how surveillance works, because as we've seen, uh, as Paneshwar already mentioned, 
there's a lot of actors involved in, especially the internet, like it's owned by the private companies, there's the state and then there's citizens, and so even to surveil somebody, the state doesn't even, he can't do this by his own, and he needs internet service providers to help him. So there have been a lot of um, developments surrounding the economic and like, there's a new, there's a lot of new ways of like, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, there's a lot of new like four games around the world and of that's coming up. And one um, that we've also looked at uh, plays with the notion of surveillance and surveillance, as you mentioned, and looks at where and how surveillance is located. So in surveillance indicates that somebody is watching from above, somebody, and that in somebody is the one who's in a social hierarchy above those that are being watched. While um, today with also the technological developments that we have with the internet and the phone, where watching somebody becomes a lot easier, not just from the state side, but also from the citizen side, or from the side of a private company. Um, it's not possible for one person or one institution to watch everybody alone, because they're being watched at the same time, uh, which is described by this notion of surveillance, which comes from the French, like so as in like you're being underneath. So also those that are socially and the higher people is lower than the ones in power, but um, they have the opportunities to watch and to monitor and to surveil those in power. And um, yeah, there's a there's a couple of examples that, that I'm going to bring. So one of the examples that are always brought up are especially mobile phones and then videos that you do capture with. And there's um, so one of the so a lot of examples are how you can take pictures or videos of police violence in the first. And then, you know, by posting this up on the internet, it's very easy to make this, I mean, it's not easy to make the person, you know, be prosecuted, but at least people, you know, find out about it. And there's a 